Thank you. Thank you for that uh, humbling introduction. Um, this is a talk that uh, I have to say was uh, motivated to a large extent by a serendipitous dinner that I had with Mike Friedman, which must have been about 10 years ago now, and uh, where we accidentally met. And uh, he taught me about the relationship between topology and quantum information. And those ideas have guided my interests and in research since then. Um, <laughs> I think it was probably the first time in a long time that somebody had sat next to you and said, so who are you and what do you do? And, and I was blissfully ignorant and it was probably uh, refreshing. Um, this is, uh, again, work that was done at Copenhagen and I also want to acknowledge Carson Flensburg who is there, uh, who a lot of the ideas um, for the experiment were kind of worked out with a theory experiment uh, collaboration between me and Carson and the others who are listed here. Um, okay, it's a colloquium. I asked and I was told this is a colloquium. This was aimed at first year graduate students who may know something about condensed matter physics. So all of you experts in the audience can um, check your email or <laughs> you know, whatever you, whatever you want to do for an hour. But this is a talk for the, uh, for the beginners. Um, <clears throat> in case you've been living under a rock for the last 20 years, um, there's, a, there's a subject called quantum information, which uh, was given a big boost by the idea that uh, math problems that are crucial to security uh, could be factor could be solved in a way that was exponentially faster than they could be solved otherwise. And I'm not going to say anything about this, and I'm, and I'm not an expert at it, but this is more like a sociological slide because this was what really got a lot of funding and a lot of popular interest and at the same time a lot of technical scientific interest um, focused on this problem was the idea that not only could a problem be solved much more efficiently using the laws of quantum mechanics than classical mechanics, but that it was a problem that people cared about. And nobody has done this yet, and we're not anywhere close, but it, it was a motivation. Um, and it's interesting to see you know, what, like what's happened since then. Uh, if, you, if you're perusing the National Security Agency website, which in case you haven't done it lately, I'll, I'll bring you up to speed, um, you can see that, um, that what's happening at the NSA is a, a preparation for the existence of quantum computers. It's going to have to revise their whole way of encrypting information. So it says, uh, we announced preliminary plans for transitioning to quantum resistant algorithms. So what a nice math problem to ask about, which is uh, what kind of problems can't a quantum computer uh, accelerate? And so th this kind of cat and mouse game exists in the, in the crypto world. Uh, but I think that's not where I want to uh, aim my career. I mean, it's a, great, it's a great math problem, but I think that it's a pretty hard one. But there are a ton of problems that uh, are you know, uh, too hard for conventional computers to solve. And there are still problems that we care about. I've made a, a list here, um, problems in material design, image processing, networks, modeling of the environment, all kinds of problems with, that computers really run out of speed. And it's certainly not, this is not a list of problems for which a quantum computing algorithm exists. This is just a list of problems that we'd like to be able to do better. Because you might tend to think, maybe not this crowd, but let's say the general public might think that we've reached the pinnacle of what we need from computation. And so it's probably worth it to think a little bit about what kinds of computer problems are we not there yet? I mean, word processors have kind of, you know, they don't need to be any faster than they are. As our fingers are the slowest part of, of all of that. So many of the things, many of the ways that we interact with computers every day they're good enough. So it's nice to ask, well, what aren't they good enough for? And these are some examples. And attention is being paid to problems uh, like materials design uh, in a way that I think makes you feel, if you're an experimentalist, like it's not that hard to think about actually doing this. For instance, oh, you can't read that. I don't know why the resolution has been reduced, but I'll help you read it. Um, Here's a paper recently from the Microsoft group uh, that talks about how to build a, a hybrid quantum classical computer, which takes something like um, 
material simulation and just takes the one hard part of, um, of this uh, process and uh, replaces that with a quantum computer. And what they say in the abstract, you can't read it, but let me help you. Um, the use of a quantum computer enables much larger and more accurate simulations than with any known classical algorithm. And, and here's the important part. And, with, um, and will allow many questions in quantum materials to be resolved once a small computer with around 100 logical qubits becomes available. So the, easy, the, the exciting word is 100. The, the um, f more frightening word is logical. That is, it may be that we have to build a thousand or some larger number of physical qubits before we can make something which is error correcting. But that ratio is not known, and that ratio is actually something that motivates this work. Because if it was just 100 physical qubits, you'd think, OK, you know, it's maybe tricky. But given that we have chips with billions of working transistors on them, the idea of making 100 of something does, just doesn't seem that hard. So it's really that ratio of logical to physical that we have to worry about. There are a lot of different ways that people are trying to make qubits. This is a, 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 a mnemonic for all of them. You're not supposed to learn anything from this slide, except to see that there are atomic physicists, superconducting physicists, semiconductor physicists. I, I have to say, would you mind if I stopped and fixed the resolution of the screen? It's kind of bugging me. It'll take me one second to do it. I don't know why it's like that, but. I think so. I think it's better now. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> Not sure. Um, so there are different ways, and in, in, in these communities uh, don't have very much in common experimentally. They have lots and lots of co in common theoretically. They're, they're reading the same papers and trying to work on the same problems. But the labs don't overlap that much, and the, the atomic physicists are going uh, about it in their atomic physics way, and the superconducting guys are going about it in their superconducting way, and the semiconductor guys are going about it in their semiconducting way. But that's going to end. That's going to end when all of these technologies have to um, converge uh, to one platform that can be uh, reproduced over and over again than a Chevrolet and all that. But they don't look different anymore. They've all become so efficient and so well designed that they all look exactly the same as each other. And you see it starting to happen, that the atomic physicists realize that in order to make not a trap of 15 or 20 of these objects, but of a million of them, they're going to have to do the same thing that the semiconductor guys do. They're going to have to build a chip, and the thing's going to have to live on a chip. And what's interesting is once you put the atoms on a chip, they feel the same electric fields that, that the spins do on their chips, and they face the same problems. So it's a historical snapshot right now that these look like different approaches, but they're going to converge and they're going to use the same techniques. And so all the stuff that I'm going to be talking about, I think, will become common platform, even though the actual object, which is constituting the two-level system, may change. Um, the technology will converge. So the technology that I'm going to focus on for this talk, this thing that came out of the conversation with Mike a decade ago, um, for me takes its motivation from the robustness of topology. Maybe you hadn't thought about topology being particularly robust. But if you tie a knot in something, it's pretty hard to get that knot out. You can't disturb it with an environmental shaking unless it's really pretty catastrophic shaking. The way you have to get a knot out is you have to actively untie the knot. And so the, you know, this is an example of these 5,000-year-old objects. But interesting, the ink has used um, a decimal system to characterize numbers. And you can still find these things with the knots tied in them. And the knots haven't come out. So it's interesting to ask whether there's an analog of this in quantum physics, which is to say that whether the coherence of the wave function, this thing which is fragile, that when it gets measured uh, is no longer quantum, it, becomes, it projects onto a classical variable. Um, is there a topological way to make that more robust so that nature, instead of decohering it by measurement, would kind of need to you know, like untie the knot in the same way that we would have to untie it classically? So we have to ask, what, you know, what does it even mean to tie a wave function in a knot, well, um, here's an example of something that you could do. In three dimensions, we know that particles are 
classifiable as either being bosons or fermions, depending on whether or not if you exchange the position of two of them, the two particle wave function picks up a minus sign. In reduced dimension, because there's no ambiguity about the notion of surrounding something in two dimensions, that's not necessarily true. And you could have, um, although they're not prevalent and indeed maybe not even known, uh, you can have particles, they don't break any laws of physics, in which by surrounding one particle by the other without ever touching it, that topological act of surrounding one by the other um, would change the two particle wave function in a way that would, in a way, constitute a memory of that action, just like that, those timelines would remember. And in a way, you know, there's a classical analog of this too, which is uh, weaving. You know, fabric is the memory of which needle went around which needle, and it gets encoded in the fabric, and it doesn't come out. It's very hard to get the, the information out of who went around who. So if you could make a, a particle that remembered who went around who, then you could do everything that you can do classically with bringing needles around each other and making fabric. And the question would be, like, what information could you encode in the fabric of the time histories of these particles going around each other? I guess that's not the first question to ask. The first question to ask is, where do these particles come from? Where do you get them? For this, we, you know, we turn to theory that has considered physical systems, like this early paper from Alexei Kataev, that said, well, there's a certain kind of system that doesn't occur in nature, but if you put a couple of ingredients together, like a one-dimensional system and a superconductor, that that system will, um, would have the possibility of having these non-abelian excitations naturally arising within the system. Now, it could be wrong, it might, might not be true, but at least the theory said that, that there could be such particles, particles that haven't been seen before, that would arise in this physical system. And what this paper went on to point out would be these things would be fantastic qubits. Because this fi it says the, uh, a finite system of length L possesses two ground states with an energy difference proportional to this exponential in L and, uh, and in different fermionic parities. Such a system can be used as qubits since they are intrinsically immune from decoherence. As long as they stay away from each other and their separation uh, is exponentially, uh, uh, th th this energy difference is exponentially small, then you can wrap them around each other, encode the information, and it won't decohere. Well, that's a nice motivation to start thinking about it. Jason Alisay, a few years later, considered, well, it's a little bit hard to imagine braiding in a one-dimensional thing. But if you could make a network of one-dimensional things, like, like these branch structures, and you could take advantage of the fact that a semiconductor can have its end point defined by electrostatics. It doesn't need to actually be the end of the wire. It just needs to be the end of where electrons are in the wire. But you can control that with voltages. So that you could, for instance, energize these voltages and m effectively move the end of the wire down here because there would be no electrons down here. And once you can energetically define the position of these endpoints by using electrostatics, then the idea of braiding and moving things around each other isn't that hard. And here's the requirement. The requirement is that this one-dimensional material needs to be in an external magnetic field such that the Zeeman splitting of energy levels inside of the material is larger than the superconducting gap. Here's the superconductor. And you might think that is, if you applied a Zeeman field strong enough to exceed the gap, you'd kill superconductivity. But these materials can have a very large G factor, much larger than the G factor of, of you know, the superconductor, which is two, because it's a metal. And so you could have a G factor of 20, which means that it's pretty easy with a magnetic field to have that exceed. So this looked like it wasn't so bad. You could Zeeman split the, 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 the semiconductor, and as long as it picked up a proximity effect from the superconductor, you could do it without destroying superconductivity in the superconductor. So, so far, so good. I mean, nobody talked at all about this thing and, like, how do you actually make that? Um, I mean, anybody can use PowerPoint. <laughs> you don't need you got to get a license to drive a car, but anybody can, anybody can draw that, and it looks pretty... I mean, anybody can drop a wire onto a superconductor, and that looks also pretty tantalizing, but it's harder when you've got to go make it. That was the first question. Where are these particles? Well, they don't occur in nature. 
it seems. I mean, you've heard this term Majorana fermion, these red balls at the end. And you've also, I mean, you almost never hear the word Majorana fermion without its, without it being described as the elusive Majorana fermion. And I think that that's a, a total misnomer. It's not elusive. It doesn't exist in nature. <laughs> but it's like, it's like bread, which also doesn't exist in nature. I mean, you have to take wheat and, you know, grind it up and you have to do something to it. But you wouldn't call bread elusive. You would just say it just doesn't exist unless you, unless you put the ingredients together to make bread. And I think it's the same, the same thing here. It's, you know, it's one of those many things that doesn't exist. Well, okay, maybe you could say it occurs in nature, but nature needed to invent intelligent beings first <laughs> as the precursor to it existing so that we could put them together. That would, I would, I would, of course, I would say that this is, of course, a natural phenomenon that we put it together. I don't know how to distinguish it, but that was the first question. Where do you get them? They're not elusive. You have to make them. The second question is, you know, what can you do with them once you have them? And that is a question that theory has gone, you know, years ahead of where the experiment are to say, once you have these things in your hands, here's what you could do. Here's how you can make a quantum computer by braiding all of these things around each other, and you can make quantum operations. And you could, in principle, and other people have done it different ways, you can do all the quantum operations that you want in this, in principle, decoherence-free way, which means that the logical qubit is the physical qubit. The ratio is one. Well, that would be nice. Then 100 qubits doesn't sound very hard. So let's start. This is an experimental talk, and I've, I haven't done anything experimental till now. The one-dimensional semiconductors grow by a process um, uh, that is pretty surprising if you haven't seen it before. Uh, it usually proceeds by putting a, a piece of gold on a semiconductor surface and putting it in a growth chamber. And the, underneath where the, where the semiconductor is, it will catalyze underneath the gold. The gold will act as a catalyst to grow more semiconductor. And it will grow right under the gold ball and just push the gold ball up in the air and produce all of these long fibers, each one with a little gold ball at the end that was the precursor of where it came from. And those get pushed up. And this thing is just crystalline perfection. Here's a, here's a zoom in. Here's that gold ball at the end of the wire. And here's a transmission electron micrograph that just shows absolute crystal perfection in this growth process that pushes this thing up in the air. So in terms of first the semiconductor part, growing it seems like a miracle, but it's an existing miracle, so we can use it. Okay, now, what do you look for if you have these Majorana particles that you've produced at the ends of these wires? Well, theory has told us what to go hunting for. And that is to try to inject electrons. You know, you think a superconductor would be something that would be easy to inject electrons into because it loves to conduct. But actually, single electrons won't go into a superconductor below the electron, below the gap. If you try below the gap to put an electron in, nothing happens. It's, a, it's an insulator below the gap. Except if there's a red ball at the end. If there's a Majorana at the end, then there's a density of states for normal electrons right in the middle of the gap, but only at the ends of the wire. If you try to inject in the middle, it's again an insulator. Only at the very ends of the wire can you inject an electron. So if you take a normal superconductor and you try to inject an electron below the gap, you get nothing. But if there's a red ball at the end, if you've managed to put a magnetic field on where the zeemon exceeds the gap, et cetera, then you'll get this density of states at zero energy right in the middle of the gap, which is a signature. Now, signature is a mild word. It's less than a smoking gun. I mean, there's a hierarchy of words. But it's not a signature either, because a signature is, you know, if, if, if you see a signature, you know who signed it. That was the, that's the meaning of a signature. But science doesn't give you that arrow, unfortunately. It doesn't let you go from phenomenon to cause. So when people talk about where's the smoking gun, where's the signature, let's be clear. There is no signature. There is no smoking gun. Science doesn't have those. All it has is preponderance of evidence. So when we start looking at data, don't ask, where's the smoking gun? Just look, because that's all you get. So here's this gap in the superconductor. And as you turn up the magnetic field and you get to a value of magnetic field, this is theory. When you get to a value of magnetic field, suddenly there'll be a peak at zero bias because these things are, are spinful. So they're moving with the slope of the Zeeman energy. They meet in the middle and they don't keep going through each other. 
they form the zero bias peak. So the conductance, this is a conductance measurement. When you try to conduct into a superconductor at zero magnetic field, you get nothing. But everywhere above magnetic field, you get something. All of a sudden, there's this thing, and it sticks at zero. And that sticking at zero is what gives it its robustness uh, to decoherence. So that's kind of what we're looking for. And this all came before people started doing the experiments. And we were really set up. We were told what to make, how much magnetic field to apply, what direction to put the magnetic field, and what to look for. So maybe you're shocked. I'm not sure you should be. Because either all the physics that led up to that was wrong, or, or you believed it was elusive. It's not elusive. You just have to do the things. And that's the amazing part of this, is that nobody had done those things before. Nobody had taken a nanowire. I, mean, I don't want to you know, denigrate the great experiment from the Delft group, but in fact, what it really is is a nanowire with superconductor put on top of it and a tunneling measure into the end. I mean, maybe the genius of this experiment was to just do exactly what theory recommended and don't get clever. Just do exactly the experiment that was supposed to work. A superconductor sitting on top of a nanowire and a tunneling measurement at the end to try to inject normal electrons. And you know what? It worked. There at zero magnetic field is this big gap where you can inject nothing. Low means low conductance. Here's a big black spot where nothing goes in. You turn up the magnetic field, and all of a sudden this football-shaped thing appears where all of a sudden now you can inject electrons. Right when you get to the magnetic field, sorry, this is magnetic field in Tesla. So when you get to a quarter of a Tesla, and the Zeeman splitting in the semiconductor, this is Indian antimonide semiconductor, equals the gap of the material. Lo and behold, this gigantic peak appears. Here it is if you like looking at raw data. Zero magnetic field, big hole in the conductance, nothing there. You turn up the magnetic field, and there's the peak, just where it was supposed to be. Now, this was an interesting history. This was really just a year after, you know, kind of the instruction set came out to do this. And, uh, you know, these weren't the only folks working on it. So this is an interesting history. Because very soon after the Delft paper, a bunch of other papers came out, including systems where you might not expect it to work, you know, where you think, well, this is not a long wire. This is just a little tiny piece of aluminum proximitizing the wire. And there's the gap, and it's aluminum, and it's indium arsenide, which has a lower G factor. And this isn't exactly a dip, but it's kind of a dip. And then it comes together and makes a big peak. Now, maybe if you hadn't seen the previous data, you wouldn't exactly call this like a, a dip and a peak. You'd think it was just something that was kind of wobbling. And since it's a symmetric function, it either has to be a minimum or a maximum. So it goes from being a minimum to a maximum. But absolutely everybody, including our group back at Harvard, you know, you know, any fool who would stick a piece of superconductor on top of a nanowire and put a, put a tunnel barrier in between it would get this gigantic peak that would show up out of, out of the middle. And you could be skeptical and you could say, oh, well, it certainly couldn't be that easy. This must be something else if you're kind of in this elusive camp that it's got to be hard. I don't think it's hard. I think it's easy. I think these things are, as soon, it's just like bread. As soon as you put the right ingredients together, it, you can't screw up bread. And I think you, it's really hard to screw up these things too. You need a dilution refrigerator and some superconductor and some nanowire, and it works. Now, there are some things to think about. One is that if I look at here's this was our data, and it's the crappiest of all of them, so I'll, I'll emphasize this one. You know, this thing, which is supposed to be a big fat zero at the origin, is really not a zero. And really nobody is a zero here. And even back to the W, it's not, it's not a zero. It's um, what you might call a soft gap. There's all these states there, which is, one, troubling because you know, you'd like to understand the experiment. Before you declare victory that you've created some new particle, you'd like to minimize the number of things you're sweeping under the rug that you don't understand. And this was one that nobody understood. The second thing is, is that if those are normal electrons that are subgap, or there are states for those normal electrons to go to, it's going to completely screw up the, the, the topological braiding. The electrons are going to get all caught up in the braiding, and they're not, the information is not going to be preserved. So it's bad news no matter what. So there was a lot of emphasis on this soft gap problem. Here's a paper from Shankar Dasarma's group in which they do numerical simulations and propose, uh, they say, we find that the interface in homogeneity with moderate dissipation is the only viable mechanism that is consistent. Well, OK, the only viable mechanism. But, OK, if we soften the language a little bit, is, is a mechanism that is consistent with the experimental observation. Our work indicates that improving the quality of the superconductor-semiconductor interface should result in a harder induced gap. That flagged 
in other, in, you know, it was in the air at the time, that flagged the problem with the experiments. The problem with the experiments was that we had basically followed Jason Alisea's beautiful picture at the beginning of just setting the nanowire on top of the superconductor. Where, okay, it wasn't exactly setting it, we were evaporating metal on top of the semiconductor. But that wasn't good enough to make an intimate contact between the superconductor and the semiconductor. And that was the problem. I mean, here it's important for me to say that the field of putting superconductors on top of semiconductors is not only an old problem, it's a problem that, uh, that to a large extent, originated at Santa Barbara. This was Herb Cromer's problem with uh, trying to induce superconductivity in a semiconductor, and there's a 30-year history of basically depositing superconductor of different kinds on semiconductors of different kinds and having moderate success. And here, here's a paper summarizing some of the moderate success in their model of how the Andrea process between the semiconductor and the superconductor worked. And here's an induced superconducting state. But never a hard gap and never the kind of things that, that we would need in order to get this to work. It was a, it was a long slog in, in many groups um, with depositing the material. So the breakthrough came a couple of years ago in Copenhagen. Uh, and here is a picture uh, that summarizes, I think, the breakthrough. And I think this is really one of the most beautiful pictures I've ever seen of anything. Uh, the left side is indium arsenide, a semiconductor that's uh, notably good for, for coupling to a metal because it has a negative work function that puts the electrons at a high density at their surface. And here's aluminum on the other side, a superconductor. And you can see that they're in exact atomic registry along the interface. And what's interesting is that th they're not lattice matched. Those aren't, you know, they're, they're not the same lattice spacing. But the aluminum finds an angle. You see it comes in like that so that the, you know, the projection of that angle matches uh, this and it lines up. And this had to do with doing it at the right temperature and the right pressures and kind of, you know, it didn't happen by accident. It was hunting around with this as the goal. But now that it works, it works. It just it just works. There's a there's a stable phase and the thing just works. So now you can grow these nanowires and when you're done growing, you can put aluminum on the outside. The, this is a lousy picture, but the interface is perfectly epitaxial. And um, when you go to make devices out of this, for instance, to make the Delft device, here's now an epitaxial wire removed so that you can make a tunnel barrier. Here's the uh, superconductor around it. Here's the tunnel barrier so that you can see. And at different magnetic fields and at different temperatures, you just reproduce the BCS density of states just perfectly. In fact, here's a comparison between experiment and theory, both as a function of magnetic field and temperature. And I would say the experiment looks better. <laughs> I think they had numerical problems or something. But anyway, <laughs> uh, but in any case, if you just concentrate on the blue curves, which are the low temperature, zero magnetic field data, the hard gap problem is a solved problem, okay? And, and, it, was a, and it was a material science problem. And I gave the title of my talk, uh, I can't remember the exact wording, but it was something about materials that, um, that really this is the story. I think it's also the story of Moore's law and the electronic revolution of the 20th century. It was material science improvements all along that made the next step of the technology possible. And I think that that's going to be the same here. The unsung hero of topological quantum computing is material science. So now let's go Majorana hunting, but now with a hard gap. So here's a, a wire. Now the aluminum is only on two of the facets of the wire. You can, you can put it on in, in one orientation and it only lands on two facets. Uh, here are gates to control the density in the wire. And there's an accidental <laughs> dot that forms at the end, a quantum dot, because there's a, there's a reflection that forms. And that produces these, uh, these crosses where you cross over from the uh, n to n plus 1 occupied n states. But you can avoid them, and it doesn't matter very much. And so the red curve or the black curve both give this very hard gap density of states. And now when you turn up the magnetic field looking for these things, if you have a very high density in the wire, you get all of these subgap states. You can also deplete it so that you have no subgap states in the wire, and then you get nothing below the gap and certainly no Majoranas. But if you tune the density correctly so that you have one or so n states, it's very easy to produce these two levels that come down and produce a state that lives at zero magnetic field. 
you can optimize it and tune it around and, and, and get this to be very bright. Here are the two levels that come down. Here's the Majorana state that comes out. Here's a numerical simulation that came out a couple of years before. And again, they had a lot of subgap states and a lot of limits of numerics. I think I would say the experiment is better. But uh, that's because it's a, it's a larger system. So at this point, we ourselves thought, OK, this looking for an end gap state is, is, is good. We can kind of check that box and move on to other problems. I, I, the one more thing I wanted to say, you can actually hybridize that end dot state with the wire state by looking at where they anticross. And where they anticross, um, the Majorana state, which lives here, and the end dot state lives here, causes a splitting of the end dot of the Majorana state. And the same thing happens in the numerics and, and the experiment. And um, you know, so I, I think everything is kind of checking out. So now we move to more complicated problems. I'm going to speed up a little bit. Um, now let's find out whether this exponential business about whether or not if you pull two Myers, Majoranas away from each other is really true. That's very important for these things to have topological protection, that they be exponentially protected. So here's a new kind of geometry. We call it the Copenhagen geometry as opposed to the Delft geometry because it's kind of an inside out version of the Delft geometry. Now the superconductor is on the inside and the normal leads are on the outside. And this whole thing forms a quantum dot that is superconducting between two aluminum leads. When you look at what happens, it's like most quantum dot, for the quantum dot people in here, if you apply a bias to the device or you move the gate voltage, which changes its occupancy, you see a familiar pattern, which is these Coulomb blockade peaks separated by non-conductance in the Coulomb blockade valleys. But something that I think if you're a quantum dot person, you've never seen before, which is Whereas above the superconducting gap, each one of these looks exactly the same as the other, below the gap, it's a different picture. This guy points to the right, this guy points to the left, this guy points to the right, this guy points to the left. So even though there are billions of electrons inside this piece of aluminum, this quantum dot knows exactly whether that number is an even number or an odd number, and every single electron is paired up in a Cooper pair. And you can see it because otherwise it wouldn't be able to keep track of whether it was an even number or an odd number. Now this funny, we call it a chicken foot, this, this funny pattern, including these areas of negative differential conductivity, was modeled, and this is, this is uh, Karsten's work of understanding, that by simply taking a BCS density of states for that superconducting dot and adding one Andreev level, one bound state in that subgap region, that you would produce effectively all of the characteristics so that this was what we were seeing when we were looking at this chicken foot pattern that we, were, that we were seeing here. What we were seeing was the transport through one Andreev state. And you can kind of identify all of the different characteristics. And this told us that we had a dot that had an Andreev bound state in it, and that that state could, in fact, then become a Majorana state in a magnetic field. This was not the first time that this NISIN I is insulator problem had been looked at. This was an old problem from the 90s. And the behavior of it is well understood. When you have an even number of electrons, this horizontal axis, which is gate voltage, uh, the occupancy of, let's say, an even number, let's say it's a 1,000, as you change the gate voltage, that energy increases parabolically because it's a capacitor. So there's a parabola. When I increase it to 1,001, then at another gate voltage, it would also be a low energy state. But because it's an odd number, it has to go in above the gap. And you have to pay one gap's worth of energy in order to uh, get an odd occupancy. Then when you're even again, it's another low energy parabola, high energy, low energy. And the position of the Coulomb blockade peaks are exactly the locations of these crossing points. When you go from even to odd, that's when there's a peak in the conductance. So the peaks would not be evenly spaced. And indeed, the same year that that theory paper came out, the experimentalists in Seclay showed making a superconducting device that when, they were, um, that when they were in the normal state, the Coulomb blockade staircase was even, 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 even spaced. But when they went to the superconducting state, every other one got pushed up in the air and they had little step, big step, little step, big step, indicating that they were um, that, that this superconducting state was lifted up by the gap. And you can see the data there. That's about how it looked at the time. It's gotten cleaner since then. Uh, but you can see even spacing and uneven spacing reflecting 
the superconductivity. Well, we have the same thing. Here's our Coulomb blockade peaks. It's a little bit hard to see from these Coulomb blockade peaks, but there's even odd, even odd, even odd. And you can tell by just measuring the peak spacing. And you see it goes big, little, big, little, big, little, big, little. If you turn up the magnetic field, not enough to kill superconductivity, but I'll give you a hint, enough to make a Majorana, then that goes away. I'm going to have to support that more. Or I can turn up the temperature, not enough to kill superconductivity, but enough to poison the device with enough quasi-particles that it doesn't know whether it's even or odd anymore. I kill that effect. Only at low temperature and low magnetic field does it know the difference between even and odd occupancy. This is a complicated, beautiful experiment. What I want to show is that wh whereas you have even odd spacing, this thing is the difference between the even and the odd spacing. So this is big step minus little step, which is finite. As you turn up the temperature, it goes away when you poison it. So this curve is the poisoning curve. This says by the time you get up to a half a Kelvin, there are so many excess quasi-particles in there that it doesn't know whether it's an even number or an odd number anymore, and it's evenly in the, in the Coulomb blockade peaks are lost. And what I want to show is that this theory curve really follows the experiment quite nicely, and it lets us calculate, because the theory curve has all the parameters in it for how many quasi-particles there are, at what point does it become poisoned, it lets us count how many quasi-particles there are inside of the system. And that's here on this right-hand axis. It tells us the density of quasi-particles at each of these points. And so the density of quasi-particles, when you finally get up to here, is something like one quasi-particle per cubic micron. But because we have such a tiny piece of aluminum proximitizing this thing, that l l ends up being a number much, much less than one. I mean, the, the number is a very rare event that there should be a quasi-particle inside the system. Let me skip this. OK, what about this exponential protection business? Do we really have protected Majoranas? I think from the, from the thing where they came down like that, we can say we have Majoranas, and then it wasn't that hard. Now the question is, do we have protected Majoranas? When a wire is long, and the Majoranas are at the ends, and they're far away from each other, those two states come down, and they make this Majorana. And, and as you turn up the magnetic field, it lasts for a while. But eventually, the fact that they can see each other you know, kind of makes those things split and oscillate. As the wire is shorter, the oscillations become bigger. And by the time the wire is short compared to the spin orbit length, then they don't even see each other at all. And they just go right through each other. So this is not Majoranas at all. And this is almost Majoranas. They're almost far away enough from each other that they became, behave like independent uh, particles. So we can take this chicken foot pattern and see where it would go in the high field limit. And we can follow the evolution of that as a function of magnetic field. And we can see for this short wire, that that level, just following where those two peaks are as a function of magnetic field, do just about what you think it should do as a low wire. It goes wah, wah, wah. It goes back and forth and back and forth. If you make the wire longer, it goes a little bit more like you know, the longer wire limit. And as the wire becomes very long, it becomes very hard to measure. You can see that it's kind of there at the origin, but it's hard to see for a reason that I have to go into now. So we'd love to. We're almost there. We've got kind of sort of Majoranas. They're pretty far away from each other, but you can still see that they're energetically interacting. But we can go farther. Oh, I, I'll skip these. Yeah, let me show you this one. This is, again, back to 1992, because the superconductivity stuff is pretty well developed. So there was another regime. Remember I said when that parabola was down here and it made the little step and the big step and the little step and the big step? You could get to a region where the gap was so much bigger than the charging energy of the quantum dot that that odd state got pushed all the way up past the crossing point. And then you would never, ever have odd occupancy. It would just go from this even state to this even state to this even state. This would be Coulomb blockade of just Cooper pair transport, nothing odd in the problem. And that was mapped out and seen and done experimentally in metals. And that's the situation that we have when we make the wires long enough to get the myron as far away from each other. Here at zero magnetic field as a function of source drain bias and the gate voltage is these 2E periodic Coulomb blockade peaks. Here's one Coulomb blockade peak and then two electrons later, the next Coulomb blockade peak. But as you turn up the magnetic field, they become big step, little step, big little step, big step, and finally evenly spaced Coulomb blockade peaks. Here's this parabola only allowing odd states. Then it comes down and finally comes down to the point where it's evenly spaced perfectly evenly spaced Coulomb blockade peaks. Almost perfectly evenly spaced Coulomb blockade peaks. 
Here they are, those two E periodic Coulomb blockade peaks transferring Cooper pairs two at a time. You turn up the magnetic field until the parabola dips down below the crossing point, and now it should be big step, little step again. And here it is, dipping down below, and they split up into evenly spaced peaks, almost. But if you analyze the position of those peaks by using a computer to track the position of the peaks and then average over all of the peaks, you see here there's only evenly spaced, there's only even valleys here because it's 2E, there's nothing odd. And as soon as they become evenly spaced, they almost become regularly spaced. In fact, they oscillate a little bit past each other. Why? Because they're not that far away from each other. The Majoranas are not out at infinity. They're just a little bit farther than they were before. So the peak spacing is still reflecting the fact that the level is not at zero. You can even see it with your eye. In fact, I mean, you feel like you might be getting tricked by the analysis, but just look right around here, like at 120. What you can see is that the odd valley is bigger than the even valley. It actually overshot before it comes back down. And that overshooting tells you that, in fact, the Majoranas are repelling each other. So all we had to do was do that experiment over and over and over again for different length devices until they finally got far away from each other. So here it is for this 900 nanometer, no, sorry, 900 micron, uh, no, 900 nanometer, 0.9 microns. And you can see they're oscillating, but when it gets up to, 100, uh, to one and a half microns, they barely move at all. And if I measure as a function of the length of the wire, how much that amplitude, here I called it A, that amplitude moves, you see, in fact, it falls off exponentially. So there's the exponential protection. A simple rule of thumb for this aluminum superconductor, if you want the thing to be uh, 10 times more protected, add another half a micron. Every half a micron is another factor of 10. So we know the numbers now, we know the protection, and we can see that it's working. Here's an interesting little detail about the data. If you look at this data, here were the 2E splitting into 1E periodic. Here's the 2E. These are different length wires. You can see something kind of surprising and cool, which is that the 2E periodic, before they become 1E periodic, they, they kind of disappear. They disappear in the middle there. And what I'd like to say is that here we understand Cooper pair transport. That's the tunneling of the 2E. Here's these states which seem to be 1E periodic. And then in the middle, it's black. It just turns black until it turns back on again with 1E. And we sort of understand that because, remember we said at the beginning that the red balls are at the end. And if you're tunneling into the end and you're tunneling out of the other end, you have to tunnel into something and something else. If there's a wave function that doesn't have support at the end, like what's going on here, then you can't tunnel in and tunnel out. But it's interesting. What this is is you tunnel into one red ball and you tunnel out of the other. And that's why there's high conductance. You don't have to tunnel in and out of the same red ball. You can tunnel into one and what, you know, what I call teleportation and teleport to the other one and leave via that one. So let's look at the wave function as I uh, look as a function of magnetic field. Here's the wave function of the extended state. And as I turn up the magnetic field, I'm just about to get to this Majorana point. The wave function doesn't care much. And then suddenly all of the support of the wave function is at the end of the wires. And that's right here where the system lights up. OK, that was fun. And they seem like they're doing everything that they're supposed to do. So now the hard part comes. And much of this talk from now on will be about the future, about what, how do we now start if we believe it. I mean, some people won't believe it, and some people will want to test it more and see more zero bias peaks and see more exponential stuff, and that's great. In fact, we're doing that ourselves. But another part of us should say, OK, let's assume it's good, and let's see how far we can go. So a paper recently written in a collaboration between the Copenhagen Lab and the Caltech group uh, put together something specific to these new kinds of wires where the superconductor is small relative to the semiconductor. This is an inversion of that original Jason Alisea picture, which had this big hunking blue superconductor and a little skinny wire sitting on top of it. Now it's a big nanowire with a little, with a little bit of a strip of superconductor along the top of it. And that allows a new kind of processing because the system itself can have a charging energy, including the superconductor. So, when, so the way we're going to play this game is by opening and closing these things that we're calling valves and making this system into something that is isolated. Now, I, there are two x's at the end and these gammas underneath it because when this system is open, it has no charging energy, 
then the even and odd parity states are still distinct, if this is a topological superconductor, but they're equal in energy. It's like a charge qubit that doesn't have any charge. There's still two states, even or odd, but they're equal in energy. But as soon as I close the valve, then what used to be equal in energy is now, I can now call them even and odd. And they sure as hell don't have the same energy now because it's an isolated object with either an even or an odd number of electrons in it. And they will read out differently. So what I've done is I've taken a state which is protected and I've projected it onto a state which is easy to measure. And the way I've done it is by closing a valve and isolating the object. And this technique of taking the, the parabolas that let us read out charge and turning them into degenerate states is something that looks familiar for people who make transmon qubits, but in fact is a, a way of projecting the, the Majorana state onto the charge readout state that makes it easy to remember. Now, I told you this is about the future, so I don't have a lot of data to show you, a little bit, but not much. But, he, but there's big plans, and I will go quickly because you can just read about it. It's all in this paper. We, I mean, we really just laid out like, you know, our next couple of years plans to initialize these Majoranas connect them, disconnect them, move them around, and do the kinds of experiments where we can demonstrate the fusion rules of the Majoranas with a control experiment that differs only by the sequence of the openings and closings of these valves. So when the valves are opened or the valves are closed, we can initialize the Majoranas in various states. And it's a, it's a great check to see the next level of what's a Majorana is how does it fuse when you put two of them together. The next level after that is how do you braid them. And so for that, we need the same kind of thing, a door with a bunch of valves and a sequence of opening and closing all of the valves. And it looks complicated, but there's a really nice control experiment, which is that if you braid something and you get an output, just braid again, and it better go back to the way it started. So you can, you can do a double braid, and then the answers are deterministic, whereas in the single braid case, they're probabilistic. Now, now the hard part for experimentalists is what's that? You know, what, how do you make that thing? I'm going to skip ahead a little bit because I want to show you a little bit more material science if I can. Yeah, let me go to here. I'm skipping some cool stuff, but I think it's interesting. Because this growth stuff, which I'm emphasizing, is a miracle. And I want to share with you this amazing technology. So remember the gold particles that the wires grew up from? Imagine you put the gold particles in a hexagonal grid that was oriented in the same hexagonal lattice structure as the underlying lattice of the crystal that it go. Then when the, when the hexagonal wires grow up, their faces on the hexagon are oriented toward each other. Now, what we can do in growing Here's the gold ball growing up. If you change the temperature in the growth chamber, you can make the side energetically more favorable than the top. The gold ball will migrate like a, like a, like a uh, flounder's eye, you know, will migrate to the side of its head. And then you turn the growth back on again, and the wire starts growing out the side in a different crystal orientation. How often does it happen? All the time. You can just bend it over and move it. Now, you put these in the hexagonal grid, and now the faces are facing each other. And so when they start growing, they run into each other. And when they run into each other, they make this kind of funny lattice structure. And if you just look at the lattice structure where this guy started growing out the side and ran into the other guy, it made one of those T-junctions right there. And so you can just take that and do all the fabrication on that that you want, and it's a grown semiconductor that's in perfect crystal orientation here and perfect crystal orientation there, and it makes the exact heat junction that you want. Now, I am the first to admit that this is not a technology. This is going to be a fun demonstration of non-abelian braiding statistics, and it's going to work, and then we're going to all congratulate each other and figure out now how do we do something. Which brings us, I think, to Santa Barbara and miracle number two. Miracle number two was um, a friendship that developed between Peter Krogstrup, who was the grower in Copenhagen who did the thing on the nanowire, and Javad Shabani, who was a postdoc of Chris Palmstrom out here. And um, working together, they took some of the ingredients of lowering the temperature and changing the pressure, 
and did the same thing in a two-dimensional structure. So here, I think maybe for the first time, if you haven't actually read this paper, is um, uh, epitaxial aluminum on a heterostructure with a perfect epitaxial interface. And when you make devices out of this two-dimensional system, you have something which is, I, I think, really, I would say, uh, Herb Cromer's dream of a two-dimensional electron gas that is fully proximatized. You can make uh, what are called Fraunhofer diffraction patterns in here, see the superconducting gap. But you can also put a gate over the top and gate it and shut it off. So it's a two-dimensional semiconductor heterostructure. Again, it was the material that, that Cromer was working on and others, the indium arsenide system, uh, now with epitaxial aluminum grown onto it. And when you start doing this, you can say, okay, make quantum point contacts, and you can see the, the uh, I'll call it the elusive uh, 4e squared over h plateau, and I use elusive to mean it's not elusive at all, you just have to do it. As soon as you have a superconductor quantum point contact normal conductor interface, you get a plateau at 4e squared over h instead of 2e squared over h, but you have to make the thing first. Hard gap inside of the semiconductor. And now we can go Majorana hunting in two dimensions. And I have to say, if this works, this is a technology because we could make a million of them or we could make a billion of them and you can do that with patterning. The little crosses are cute, but we have to get this to work to really be able to make a million of them. So let's get started. Here's a wire that's patterned by removing the aluminum and then putting a top gate that constricts it down to living in this one dimension and a tunneling barrier at the end made out of quantum point contacts. Turn up the magnetic field and looking for Majoranas. Not yet. It's not working. Why? I don't know. It's not working yet. It's the first time. So they're a little bit elusive. You know, you can't just do anything and get them to work. We thought maybe this was so easy that the first time you made a wire and you compress it, my guess is that it's a multi-mode wire. There's too much in it. You needed it to be a one-dimensional wire, and you needed to deplete all of those other modes. But in any case, we're not there yet in, in uh, two dimensions. But if we can get there, then I really have faith that this stuff can be reproduced in the, in the millions. As long as we're here, though, and as long as it's a physics colloquium, there are a couple of other applications of this material that I just want to flash that I think are interesting. One is a technology, which is to make something called a multiplexer, something where you can, with, with a small number of decisions, guide an exponentially wide choice. And I say exponential because what I said here was, if you have n control lines and they're each binarily split, then with a logarithmic number of gates, you can steer it to one of n possible outcomes. And the nice thing about this is it's all superconducting. When the gates are up, you have a superconducting line that goes from the input to that output by making the right choices of those gates with no resistance and all the other ones are depleted. So you can make a switching network that is zero resistance. That's kind of interesting. It probably has some technological applications and didn't exist before. Here's another piece of you know, bare physics. I, I don't know if Matthew Fisher is around, but this is a problem near to his heart, which is the superconductor insulator transition. Well, people used to make the superconductor insulator transition system by evaporating in situ these materials and making them thicker and thicker and thicker until they became a superconductor. And, and before that, they would be an insulator and they would cross over. Well, now we can just remove, this is a, a blow up of a couple of hundred thousand of these squares with the aluminum removed in between. We can now put a gate over the whole array of 100,000 of them and just walk directly between the superconductor and the insulator state, the insulator when the gate is depleted, the superconductor when the gate is up. Here are all of these crosses that cross at this uh, universal uh, uh, h over 4 e squared uh, conductance. Above this is an insulating state. You see at low temperature, it's higher resistance than at high temperature. Below is a, is a superconducting state, lower resistance at low temperature. And because you now have access to disorder, temperature, and magnetic field, you can map out the whole disorder temperature magnetic field phase diagram just by sweeping gate voltages. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a new technology and a bunch of problems that used to be really hard to do when you lived in the all metals world can now take advantage of superconducting physics. The last example, and I want to I say that um, my colleague Ferdinand Cumit will be giving a talk here on Tuesday, I think, is that Wednesday, uh, and he'll talk about some of this stuff too. The last, again, you know, has a Santa Barbara uh, connection, 
to take some of the things that John Martinez works on, the, the transmon qubit, and again ask, is there a semiconductor angle to this that takes advantage of these new materials? And indeed there is. So here is the qubit. It's at SNS or SIS junction, which is exactly what John and the, you know, and Leo DiCarlo and uh, Andreas Walroff and uh, Rob Shulkoff and everybody who's making qubits do it all exactly the same way using aluminum, aluminum oxide, aluminum tunnel junctions with an SIS interface that they control the, the Josephson energy of this thing by making two of them and putting them in a squid configuration and putting magnetic flux through the hole in the middle. Here's another way to control the Josephson energy. Just turn on the gate voltage. The gate voltage depletes the semiconductor, changes the Josephson energy. So you make the entire transmon, now instead of having a current line with milliamps of current that control the flux, you just have a voltage, a non-dissipative voltage that controls the flux. And when you make a qubit out of it, it works great. It's true that it doesn't work as well as John's qubits do right now. And we don't know why. But one thing that I can say, so I wanted to say, here's the squids that John, that John uses where he puts the current through this. And it's important to recognize that th these are pretty heavy currents. And when, when you scale up, they can, they can um, you know, they can, you could get up to amps if you have a uh, thousand qubits or so. So we think that there's an advantage to using voltages to control these. But I, I wanted to say, it's important to say we're not at John's level yet. Um, but just to give you a timeline, you know, we just kind of invented these things. And here were the, the, the quality factors of the resonators that we make. Here it was in June 2015 when we did our first two qubit experiment. You know, and then we discovered that the screws that we were using had a small amount of nickel in them. That, you know, and we got rid of those and it went up by a factor of two. And then, and then there was this epoxy that we were using. We got rid of the epoxy and that really brought it up. You know, and so we're chasing uh, the, the leaders of this community with a new idea. And the idea is to use voltages instead of fluxes to, to do control. And it has some advantages when you scale because you can send, you can send a lot of volts down a, down a line and it doesn't dissipate any electricity. But when you send an amp down a line into a refrigerator, it does. Uh, if it's all superconducting electronics, it doesn't. But they're coming down from room temperature. This is the last view graph that I want to show. And it's uh, not anything that we've built. This is a field programmable gate array, state of the art device with about 6 billion transistors inside of it, and they all work. I mean, if you were to ask me, what's the hard part of this topological quantum computing technology? Is it to make Majoranas? I think not. Is it to make low temperatures? No, we already have that. Magnetic field, we already have that. Maybe it's the idea of making billions of things on a nanometer scale and having them all work. But shockingly, we've already done that. Look at the scale. This is, this is 120 nanometers from here to here. So that line is 20 nanometers wide. That was made with optical lithography, 20 nanometer feature size on a commercial chip that you can go buy now. So I think that we can take off of our worry list the idea of making a billion things and having them all work. Right now, they did it for this purpose, to have it work at room temperature. But you could ask, what would happen if I took that FPGA and put it down at millikelvin temperatures? I think nobody knows. I think nobody's ever done it. I mean, maybe, maybe the device is already existing. Well, it's already silicon. You'd have to add the rest of the ingredients. But the point that I want to make is that if you thought that the hard part was integrating these things, the, the I don't know how many tens of billions of dollars have been spent globally on developing the technology to do that for the semiconductor industry. It's already been done. And we're just going to borrow that technology with something that we think already works. So um, thank you for coming on this adventure with me from uh, basic physics to, to uh, what we hope will be advanced technology. Thanks. Not a single question. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Brave soul. <laughs>
Yeah, I'm not sure you could take that phrase teleporting too seriously. It's not like Star Trek teleporting. Oh, sure, sure. Okay. Uh, but we can call it that. Okay. Um, I was just wondering if, if there were some uh, characteristic speed that the electrons normally conduct. If you could, if you could measure an increase in that speed from, from the Yeah, you know, I have to say, I've argued about that exact question so much that I don't know the answer. I think I knew more before I started arguing about how quickly does an electron come in and then go out the other side? Is it the Fermi energy that controls it? Um, I think I don't know the answer. Maybe there's a smart person in the room who knows the answer. Anyone know? Carson, do you know? Oh, sorry. On a? No. I want it to be big. I want those those things away from each other. No, isn't that fantastic? I mean, th this is not mesoscopic physics. This is not the old days where you have an L phi, which has to do with a, a, an electron uh, diffusing down through a metal and retaining its phase coherence. This is a different animal. If I take those things 20, 30, 40 microns away from each other, it's a coherent object. Why? Because it's a delta function in energy at, at the origin. And that, I mean, that delta function sets the time scale. The inverse of that delta function is the time scale. So we don't face the normal L phi physics or coherence length in a superconductor, you know, H over the gap. We don't face those in this, and this, that's what makes it incredible. So uh, the smallest size of the stuff is quite uh, uh, coherence ratio. Uh, I wanted to correct myself before I answer that second question, which is, what I just said was theory, you know, and experimentally, I have no idea whether or not it's coherent over 20 microns. It, that experiment, the, the next test, which is the quantum coherence, putting this thing in an Aronoff Bohm ring and seeing the interference pattern, you know, you could say rush home and go do that experiment, but I don't know the answer to that experiment yet. So speaking theoretically, it should last for a long time. Experimentally, we have to do the experiment. Sorry, I, I want to back off from my sureness. Now your second question. Um, so the smallest size uh, structure is done by the rate. Yeah, yeah. I would say that the smallest structure, as far as I understand, I mean, there's a lot of brains in the room that can help me out here. Um, the smallest structure is limited by the coherence length of the induced pro, uh, topological gap in the material. So h bar over that gives a time, a Fermi velocity times that gives a length, and that has to be longer, the, the wires have to be longer than that. So it's really that they can't get too short or else they'll start doing that crossing thing that they do. You could, for instance, use a larger gap superconductor. You have to induce a larger proximity gap with stronger spin orbit coupling, and that'll shorten the length scale. Aluminum is a pretty feeble superconductor, so it's a relatively long length. If you moved to niobium or you made stronger spin orbit coupling material by using indium antimonide instead of indium arsenide, you could probably make it shorter. Yeah, so I think that the, that the idea of a logical qubit, which depends on the implementation, is a pretty well-defined concept. And where the field is now is in its way to building one logical qubit whose extended coherence has to be demonstrated. So you won't accidentally stumble upon a logical qubit. You'll start this whole game by building one and showing that it has a longer coherence time than its constituent parts. That is, that the, that the, that the whole is greater than the, than the elements. And when you have that, that, that the extended object has a longer coherence time. It's not going to happen by accident. We're going to work hard to get one of those things. The idea might be, though, the idea is that the topological ones will have a smaller number of physical objects in it before you achieve that extended coherence in the, in the collective. 
it's it's understood, and you know this is something that John Martinez has probably given talks about here, that in a transmon qubit or a spin qubit, it's numbers like a thousand or so, and the designs are pretty well established, and they have not been achieved. Well, they're on the edge of being achieved now. Some people have shown some kind of increased coherence. That's that's really state of the art right now. In topological business, we're a generation behind. What we're hoping is even though we're a generation behind, we'll have fewer that we have to put together. So we'll catch up. Correct. And then the, the state will then be probabilistically in one. Yes, so yes. Now, nobody, no experimentalist likes to know to have an output which is a 50-50 something. You think, you know, I could have a broken machine or a noisy output or a, anything bad could give me this 50-50. So that is the result of the braid, is that something will have a 50-50 output of being, as, you know, measuring even or measuring odd when you measure not very satisfying. The saving is that if you do the operation twice, it comes back to being deterministic. And no noise would solve, would, you know, would, would satisfy that. So it has to do both things. It has to come out 50-50 the first time you braid, but 100-0 the second time you braid. And that, to me at least, feels like, OK, I could stand behind a result that like got better the second time you do it. I mean, maybe it's going to come out you know, 50-50, 70-30, you know, I'd call that a win. 